On December 15, 1791, the first ten amendments, known as the Bill of Rights, were ratified and became part of the U.S. Constitution. However, there's more to the story than just names and dates. Why is our Bill of Rights included as amendments to the Constitution rather than part of the original document? How was it created? Why was it created? And what is the state of the Bill of Rights today in the 21st century? Let's celebrate the 229th anniversary of these amendments by finding the answer to those questions next on the Constitution Study. There's one thing you have to know wherever you make your stay. Came from a long through line of everyday Americans. Hello there, everyday Americans. Paul Engel here with the Constitution Study, where we read and study the Constitution. We teach the rising generation to be free. I am glad you could join me. It's been a challenging couple of weeks. I'm glad you're still here. I'm glad you're still watching. As you may know, uh, not only has Facebook now kept me from posting for a month, now they've actually disabled my account. So we're going to be looking for some changes to the Constitution study. So please stay tuned. Uh, as always, you can follow me on the newsletter. Just go to the constitutionstudy.com, click the sign up for the newsletter and find out more. Also, since the Bill of Rights Day is this week, I have a special offer. So again, head to that website. You can get a free copy of my book, Read the Constitution in 30 Days, just by signing up at the Constitution Study. Find out more. Again, constitutionstudy.com. It's right there at the top of the page. You can find out more. I'm also going to be making some changes to the Scholar program, so watch out for announcements. Again, Newsletter is the best place to find out about that. If you like the work that I'm doing here and you want to support this podcast, these video blogs, please hit the donate button. Help pay for some of the, the software I need to use and some of the tools I need to keep bringing you these videos and to make them even better. So with that, let's take a look at our Bill of Rights. The story of the Bill of Rights begins on September 17, 1787 with the signing of the Constitution of the United States and its presentment to the states for ratification. Five of the 13 states, Delaware, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Georgia, and Connecticut, quickly ratified the new agreement, while several states opposed the document because it failed to protect the basic rights of the people. It seems as if political intrigue about the future of our nation is nothing new in America. While not political parties as we know them today, there were two main political factions in America when the Constitution was signed, the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. The Federalists included such laudable names as Alexander Hamilton, John Jay, and James Madison. Together, they anonymously published 85 essays lobbying for the adoption of the proposed Constitution. The Anti-Federalists included people like Richard Henry Lee, Patrick Henry, and George Mason. They and many more also anonymously published essays, but these were critical of the proposed Constitution. One of the areas of disagreement between these two factions was the question of a Bill of Rights. Anti-Federalists were generally wary of a powerful central government, since America had just fought a war for liberty against a powerful central government. Now, the Anti-Federalists, knowing firsthand what such a government can do, were adamant that protections for the rights of the people needed to be part of this more perfect union. They were concerned that a central government could easily infringe on any right without specific prohibitions in the Constitution. On the other hand, the Federalists, after seeing how ineffective the Congress under the Articles of Confederation was, wanted to make sure that any new government would have the power to exercise any authority it was given. The Federalists argued that since the central government was not given any power to infringe on the rights of the people, a Bill of Rights was unnecessary. In fact, they were concerned that by listing rights in the Constitution, someone would get the idea that the central government would have the authority to regulate them. History, by the way, has shown that both sides were right. The dispute between these two positions got quite heated in many of the states, to the point that civil war almost broke out in Rhode Island. Without at least nine states willing to ratify it, the new Constitution appeared about to go down in defeat. Then some anti-federalists in Massachusetts came up with a compromise. They would support ratification only with the assurance that amendments creating a Bill of Rights would be proposed by the first Congress. After Massachusetts, Maryland, South Carolina, and New Hampshire quickly ratified the Constitution with the same requirement, providing the nine states necessary for the agreement to take effect on June 21, 1788. Virginia and New York ratified the Constitution later that summer. North Carolina did so in November 1789, and lastly, Rhode Island in May of 1790. 
Now, it was agreed that the new government under the newly ratified Constitution would begin in March 1789. And per their agreement with Massachusetts and the other reluctant states, quickly began work on a Bill of Rights. Many people refer to the rights protected by the First Amendment as our first freedoms. However, James Madison, with input from many of his colleagues, drafted 12 amendments to the Constitution, which were sent to the states for ratification on September 25, 1789. While only 10 of them were ratified originally, the first two amendments were left to languish. The first proposed amendment, setting the size of the House of Representatives, has never been ratified. The second, preventing any law changing the pay of Congress from taking effect until after the next election, wasn't ratified until 1992 and is now the 27th Amendment to the Constitution. Now, three states, New Jersey, Maryland, and North Carolina, ratified the 3rd through 12th Amendments in 1789, while six more, South Carolina, New Hampshire, Delaware, New York, Pennsylvania, and Rhode Island, well, they did so in 1790. Vermont, which entered the Union in March of 1791, and Virginia ratified them in the same year. With Virginia being the 11th state to ratify the amendments, they legally became part of the Constitution. The remaining states, Massachusetts, Georgia, and Connecticut, did not ratify the amendment since it was not legally necessary. However, on the 150th anniversary of the submission of the amendments to the states in 1939, all three states symbolically submitted their approval to Congress. The Bill of Rights is not only important for its function of legally protecting the rights of the American people, but for what rights it protects. Many people seem to focus on the First or Second Amendments, but does anyone else find it interesting that half of the amendments in the Bill of Rights protect our right to due process. Just as the Declaration of Independence includes many more grievances than the taxation without representation we all learned in school, the Bill of Rights protects a lot more than just freedom of speech, press, and bearing of arms. Why did those who wrote and ratified the Bill of Rights place so much emphasis on our due process rights? Well, to understand that, we need to understand what due process is. The Free Legal Dictionary defines due process as an established course for judicial proceedings or other governmental activities designed to safeguard the legal rights of the individual. Yes, your rights of freedom to religion, speech, press, assembly, and petition are all important. But what good are they if there's no way to safeguard those rights? Yes, the right to keep and bear arms is there to ensure that both you and your state remain free. But without the protections of due process, how do you defend that right? The Declaration of Independence says that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just power from the consent of the governed. What happens when those in government see their role not as protecting our rights, but protecting us? The answer is as simple as it is sweeping. When we lose our rights to due process, we cease to be citizens in a free republic, and become subjects of a tyrannical government. And before you think I'm referring to some dystopian future, I want to tell you plainly that today, in America, we live not as citizens, but more as subjects. Noel Webster defines citizen in his dictionary as the native of a city or an inhabitant who enjoys the freedom and privileges of the city in which he resides. And he defines subject as being under the power and dominion of another. Ask yourself, do you enjoy the freedom and privileges of citizenship within the United States of America? Or are you under the power or dominion of governments? Are, are you free to move about your city or state without restrictions? Or do others issue rules and edicts to control your movements? Are you able to engage in any legitimate business when and where you desire? Or must you submit to government for permission to do so? And who decides whether your business is legitimate and what is essential? Can you engage in whatever form of employment you desire? Or does government mandate that you must join an organization to do so? Are you free to worship, speak, and publish whatever you want without government interference or approval? Ask those in California and New York who have been ordered to limit both how they are allowed to worship and how many at a time. 
Can you gather with friends and family for the holidays? Or do government edicts control that as well? Can you exercise your right to keep and bear arms freely? Or must you seek permission from those who hold dominion over you? Are you free to peaceably assemble? Or is that determined by whether or not you are in a group favored by the current government? And when you petition the government for a redress of grievances, are your claims treated with respect or with political bias? How did this happen? How did the American people fall from free citizens who instituted governments to protect their rights to subjects of governors, mayors, and innumerable bureaucrats who assume the power to tell us how to live our lives and seem more than willing to use force to get their way? The answer to that question is also as simple as it is sweeping. We stopped being the overseers of those in government, and we let due process fade into tradition, myth, and legend. You may think I'm wrong, that the Bill of Rights still protects you, but the Bill of Rights is just ink on parchment. Unless it is used, and unless the rules it establishes are followed and enforced, the Bill of Rights can no more protect you than a squirt gun can protect you from a forest fire. You may say that the courts are there to enforce the protections enshrined in the Bill of Rights, but they are some of the chief abusers of due process. Remember, it was the courts that deemed that governments can infringe on your rights if they have a sufficiently compelling government interest. It was courts that said that governments could steal from you in an effort to punish criminals. And it was courts that said government employees could violate the law as long as the courts hadn't previously told them that they couldn't. Does that sound like a process designed to safeguard our rights? In his first inaugural address, George Washington said, And since the preservation of the sacred fire of liberty and the destiny of the Republican model of government are justly considered as deeply, perhaps as finely staked, on the experiment entrusted to the hands of the American people. What use is the Bill of Rights if those who have sworn to uphold the Constitution ignore it when it's inconvenient. It's not the governments who have subjugated the people. We, the people, have done it to ourselves. We have hired elected officials that are abusing our rights. While in most cases, those judges who are destroying due process are not elected, they are appointed by people we elected to do so. And judges, bureaucrats, and all government officials can be removed by the very same representatives we hire. Yet it seems the American people are not interested in protecting their rights, due process or otherwise. They seem more interested in party politics, accepting government bribery and social media than in their right to live free. What would John Adams think of the state of freedom in America today? Posterity, you will never know how much it costs the present generation to preserve your freedom I hope you will make a good use of it. If you do not, I shall repent in heaven that I ever took half the pains to preserve it. To all the American people who failed to make good use of the blessings of liberty our founding fathers purchased at so high a price, I ask if you're happy now. We have left those who paid so much for our freedom to repent of all the blood, sweat, and tears they paid so you and I could be free. Yes. December 15th is a day we should remember the Bill of Rights and the freedoms it was designed to protect. In the 21st century, however, it should also be a day of weeping for the empty shell it has become. The fault for its demise lies not with those in government who ignore the Constitution, nor with the courts who so frequently abuse it. Rather, the fault lies squarely with the American people, who thought that freedom and liberty would always be there so they failed to defend it when it was under attack. As Ronald Reagan said, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it on to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, and handed on for them to do the same. Or one day, we will spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it was once like in the United States where men were free. So this video is releasing on December 14th. You have a day left to remember the Bill of Rights. The question is, will we 
put it on some pedestal and ignore the state that it's in. When we look at its, at its tattered edges, at, at the corroded meaning that it has, and vow to restore it to its place of glory. When we look at the use we've made of the freedoms that were purchased for us and recommit ourselves to restoring freedom and liberty in America, will we take our hired officials and hold them accountable for the abuses they have committed in our name and by our authority to those very rights we claim to cherish? Every time any American's rights are infringed upon, it is destructive, it is corrosive to the blessings of liberty for all Americans. You may not have a business that is shut down. You may not have speech that is infringed upon. You may not have to beg for permission to carry a firearm. But every time one of our fellow citizens is, it diminishes all of us. Now, you may question the, the wisdom of whether or not the Bill of Rights was put in the original document or added afterwards. You may debate the positions of the Federalists or the Anti-Federalists. But ultimately, the question is, when you look at the Bill of Rights, what do you see? Do you see something we are to aspire to, or do you see something that doesn't matter? Do you see rules and regulations and laws that governments are required to follow, or do you see suggestions that they can manipulate whenever they want? Did we create these governments, or didn't we? Are we a free people? Will we realize that We've been lazy. We've been lackadaisical. We have not fought for. We have not protected liberty. We may have stood up when something touched us, but we didn't protect the liberty of others. We, we acted like liberty was normal. Freedom and liberty are not normal. They are the exception, not the rule, even in the world today. That's why so many people, as, as much as our Bill of Rights has been diminished and degraded, People from around the world still want to come here because it's still better than everywhere else. So my question is, do we look at the Bill of Rights? Do we look at our governments? Do we look at our courts? Do we look at the bureaucrats and say, eh, that's good enough? Or do we look at the Bill of Rights and say, that's not simply a standard we want to obtain. That is a law we must guard and protect. We must uphold. And if we won't control our government, then we have no excuse when our government controls us. I fear that we will spend our sunset years explaining to our children and our children's children what it was once like to live in a free country. Because as bad as the infringement on these rights have been over the decades, this coronavirus and the reaction governments have had to it has shown that the Bill of Rights is a, is a paper tiger. It means nothing unless we, the people, enforce it. See, we keep waiting for government to, to enforce it. We think if we, if we hire the right president, hire the right governor, hire the right legislature, put the right people on the courts, magically the Bill of Rights will be strong again and our rights will be protected. It doesn't work that way. We must uphold the Bill of Rights. We must not simply hire these people. We must demand that they follow the law. And if they don't, they must be fired. Now, if the bad news is we have let things fall this far, the good news is we can fix it. It's not going to be quick and it's not going to be easy, but it is fairly simple. Look at your government officials as your employees. Look at the Constitution of the, your state and of the United States as their handbook. These are the laws they are required to follow and make them follow them. If they refuse to follow them, their laws are void. Ignore them. Oh, sure, they may come after you. And there's plenty of examples of people being fined and, and cited and in some cases jailed for ignoring laws and orders that are void because they violate the supreme law of the land. But if we don't stand up for our rights, if we don't use peaceful noncompliance to ignore the bad actions of governments, then we are no longer a free people. If we act like we work for government rather than the other way around, we are subjects, not citizens. 
You may say, but we still have elections. Yeah, that merely means we get to pick our despots. Do we pick a good tyrant or a bad tyrant? We're still picking a tyrant. Let December 15th, 2020 be a day that is remembered and recognized. Let it be an opportunity for us to recommit to the protection of our rights. How can you do that? Well, as John Jay said, you start by reading and studying the Constitution and teaching the rising generation to be free. Go to the website, constitutionstudy.com. Everything there is free for you to use, free for you to share. And if you sign up, you get a free copy of my book, Read the Constitution in 30 Days. If you've never read the Constitution before, this is a simple way for you to read the Constitution. It's, I have it in 30 days because no one believes me when you can read it in 30 minutes. It is small, bite-sized chunks of the Constitution with a short commentary for, to boot. Even if you've read the Constitution before, commit to reading it again. Make it a habit. I set this up as a 30-day read because I want it to be like, like a devotional. Take a couple of minutes every day, read it, and repeat. Let's get used to the idea of understanding what's in our Constitution. If you want to go to the next level, if you want to study the Constitution, you'll have a chance to buy a copy of my book when you sign up for, the, for this as well. You can get a digital copy of the book, and you can get in and study it. Also, keep your eye out. I have an, an organization, a group called the Constitution Scholar, and that's going to have a change come January 1st. At least that's the plan. I want it to be a place where we can get together and discuss and engage, and there's going to be a free option. So you won't even have to pay for it. For absolutely free, you'll be able to get into the Constitution study and have access to fellow Americans that want to read and study the Constitution, that want to defend their liberty, and are willing to find each other and work together to do so. So keep your eyes out. That'll be, again, January 1st or somewhere right around there. Most of all, please share this information. Share the video. Share the article. Share whatever you want. Let us spread far and wide the knowledge of our Constitution, our rights, our liberties, and how we defend them. And if you found this of any use at all, well, please not only share it, but come and bring friends the next time for the Constitution study. There's one thing you have to know wherever you make your stand. Came from